Welcome to Come Follow Me Canadian Style. We're in week 18 of the Book of Mormon and we'll be covering Mosiah 4 through 6 today. Chapter 4, verse 1. And it came to pass that when King Benjamin had made an end of speaking the words which had been delivered unto him by the angel of the Lord, that he cast his eyes round about on the multitude, and behold, they had fallen to the earth, for the fear of the Lord had come upon them. That phrase, the fear of the Lord, reminded me of the scripture in Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They were wise because of verse 4. They viewed themselves in their own carnal state, even less than the dust of the earth. And they all cried aloud with one voice, saying, Oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ, that we may receive forgiveness of our sins, and our hearts may be purified. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth and all things, who shall come down among the children of men. And it came to pass that after they had spoken these words, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. They were filled with joy, having received a remission of their sins, and having peace of conscience because of the exceeding faith which they had in Jesus Christ, who should come, according to the words which King Benjamin had spoken unto them. From Elder Holland, however late you think you are, however many chances you think you have missed, however many mistakes you feel you've made or talents you think you don't have, or however far from home and family and God you feel you've traveled, I testify that you have not traveled beyond the reach of divine love. It is not possible for you to sink lower than the infinite light of Christ's atonement shines. And then from President Packer. The great morning of forgiveness may not come at once. Do not give up if you at first fail. Often the most difficult part of repentance is to forgive yourself. Discouragement is part of the test. Do not give up. That brilliant morning will come. Then the peace of God which passes understanding comes into your life once again. Then you like him will remember your sins no more. How will you know? You will know. Verse 9. Believe in God, believe that he is, and that he created all things both in heaven and in earth. Believe that he has all wisdom and all power, both in heaven and in earth. Believe that man doth not comprehend all things which the Lord can comprehend. And again, believe that you must repent of your sins and forsake them and humble yourself before God and ask in sincerity of heart that he would forgive you. And now, if you believe all these things, see that you do them. Verse 11, and again I say unto you, as I have said before, that as you have come to the knowledge of the glory of God, or if you have known of his goodness and have tasted of his love, and received a remission of your sins, which causes such exceeding great joy in your souls, even so I would that you should remember and always retain in remembrance the greatness of God and your own nothingness, and his goodness and long suffering towards you unworthy creatures. And humble yourself even into the depths of humility, calling on the name of the Lord daily, and standing steadfastly in the faith of that which is to come, which was spoken of by the mouth of the angel. Now you'll notice here that I underlined the word nothingness. And if you think about some of the other words he uses, like unworthy, when I first read these words, I thought, huh, that might be just a little bit harsh. But then I remembered in Moses, chapter 1, verse 9, that after the presence of the Lord withdrew from Moses and he fell to the earth, this is what he said. Verse 10, And it came to pass that it was for the space of many hours before Moses did again receive his natural strength like unto man. And he said unto himself, Now for this cause I know that man is nothing, which thing I had never supposed. I think too often we as people get puffed up and proud. Maybe it's an Israelite trait that we become proud and one of the best things that we can acknowledge is our own nothingness and his greatness moses didn't suffer from this too long because you remember in the story that after satan comes tempting him in verse 13 he says who art thou for behold i am the son of god in the similitude of his only begotten so moses acknowledges that God is everything, and his own nothingness allowed him to realize also that he was the Son of God. Back to Mosiah 4, verse 12. 
I say unto you that if you do this, you shall always rejoice and be filled with the love of God and always retain a remission of your sins. From Elder Maxwell. Much emphasis was given by King Benjamin to retaining a remission of our sins. We do not ponder that concept very much in the church. We ought to think of it a lot more. Retention clearly depends on the regularity of our repentance. In the church, we worry and should over the retention of our new members. But the retention of our remissions is cause for even greater concern. And if you go back to that scripture we just read in Mosiah, you'll note that I underlined, if you do this, that this was recognizes in humility who we are, even though we're children of God compared to him. We're nothing. So if we do this, then verse 13, you will not have a mind to injure one another, but to live peaceably and to render to every man according to that which is his due. And you will not suffer your children that they will go hungry or naked. Neither will you suffer that they transgress the laws of God and fight and quarrel one with another and serve the devil who is the master of sin or who is the evil spirit which hath been spoken of by our fathers he being an enemy to all righteousness. If we teach our children these attributes of humility, then they too will understand what the Lord would have them do in their life. Verse 15, Behold, we will teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness. We will teach them to love one another and to serve one another. And also you yourself will succor those that stand in need of your succor. Ye will administer of your substance unto them that stand in need. And you will not suffer that the beggar putteth up his petition to you in vain and turn him out to perish. From President Hinckley, the health of any society, the happiness of its people, their prosperity and their peace all find their roots in the teachings of children by fathers and mothers. From President Nelson, scriptures direct parents to teach faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Parents are to teach the plan of salvation and the importance of living in complete accord with the commandments of God. Otherwise, their children will surely suffer in ignorance of God's redeeming and liberating law. Parents should also teach by example how to consecrate their lives using their time, talents, tithing, and substance to establish the church and the kingdom of God upon the earth. Living in that manner will literally bless their posterity. Verse 17, perhaps thou shalt say, the man has brought upon himself his misery, therefore I will stay my hand. I will not give unto him of my food, nor impart unto him of my substance, that he may not suffer, for his punishments are just. But I say unto you, O man, whosoever doeth this, the same hath great cause to repent, and except he repent of that which he hath done, he perisheth forever, and hath no interest in the kingdom of God. From President Hinckley, let us be more merciful. Let us get the arrogance out of our lives, the conceit, the egotism. Let us be more compassionate, gentler, filled with forbearance and patience, and a greater measure of respect one for another. In so doing, our very example will cause others to be more merciful, and we shall have greater claim upon the mercy of God, who in his love will be generous towards us. For behold, are we not all beggars? So spoke King Benjamin, to which I add that the power of the master is certain and his word is sure. He will keep his promise towards those who are compassionate. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I am confident that a time will come for each of us when, whether because of sickness or infirmity, of poverty or distress, of oppressive measures against us by man or nature, we shall wish for mercy. And if through our lives we have granted mercy to others, we shall obtain it for ourselves. Verse 26. And now for the sake of these things which I have spoken unto you, that is for the sake of retaining a remission of your sins from day to day, that you may walk guiltless before God, I would that you should impart of your substance to the poor, every man according to that which he hath, such as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and administering to their relief, both spiritually and temporally, according to their wants. And see that all things are done in wisdom and order. 
for it is not requisite that a man should run faster than he has strength. And again, it is expedient that he should be diligent, that thereby he might win the prize. Therefore, all things must be done in order. From Elder Maxwell, when we run faster than we are able, we get both inefficient and tired. I have on my office wall a wise and useful reminder by Anne Morrow Lindbergh concerning one of the realities of life. She wrote, My life cannot implement in action the demands of all the people to whom my heart responds. That's good counsel for us all, not as an excuse to forego duty, but as a sage point about pace and the need for quality in relationships. Verse 29. And finally, I cannot tell you all things whereby you may commit sin, for there are diverse ways and means, even so many, that I cannot number them. But this much I can tell you, that if you do not watch yourselves, and your thoughts, and your words, and your deeds, and observe the commandments of God, and continue in the faith of what you have heard concerning the coming of our Lord, even unto the end of your lives, you must perish. And now, O man, remember and perish not. On to chapter 5. And now it came to pass that when King Benjamin had thus spoken to his people, he sent among them, desiring to know of his people, if they believed the words which he had spoken unto them. And they all cried with one voice, saying, Yea, we believe all the words which thou hast spoken unto us. And also we know of their surety and truth, because of the Spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us, or in our hearts, that we have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. From President Nelson. We can change our behavior. Our very desires can change. True change, permanent change, can only come through the healing, cleansing, and enabling power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of change. Verse 7, And now because of the covenant which you have made, you shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For you say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore you are born of him and have become his sons and daughters. Now we talked last week about becoming the children of Christ, that we're adopted into his family, and that we have this change in us. We're born again. Verse 8, And under this head ye are made free, and there is no other head whereby ye can be made free. There is no other name given whereby salvation cometh. Therefore, I would that you should take upon you the name of Christ, and all you that have entered into the covenant with God, that ye should be obedient unto the end of your lives. And it shall come to pass that whosoever doeth this shall be found at the right hand of God, for he shall know the name by which he is called for he shall be called by the name of Christ. And now it shall come to pass that whosoever shall not take upon him the name of Christ must be called by some other name. Therefore he findeth himself on the left hand of God. From the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, in obedience there is joy and peace unspotted, unalloyed. And as God has designed our happiness, he never has, he never will institute an ordinance or give a commandment to his people that is not calculated in its nature to promote that happiness. From Elder Oaks, we see that we take upon us the name of Christ when we are baptized in his name, when we belong to his church and profess our belief in him, and when we do the work of his kingdom. There are other meanings as well, deeper meanings, that the more mature members of the church should understand and ponder as he or she partakes of the sacrament. It is significant that when we partake of the sacrament, we do not witness that we take upon us the name of Christ. We witness that we're willing to do so. The fact that we only witness to our willingness suggests that something else must happen before we actually take that sacred name upon us in the most important sense. Our willingness to take upon us the name of Jesus Christ affirms our commitment to do all that we can to be counted among those whom he will choose to stand at his right hand and be called by his name at the last day. In this sacred sense, our witness that we're willing to take upon us the name of Jesus Christ constitutes our declaration of candidacy 
for exaltation in the celestial kingdom. Exaltation is eternal life, the greatest of all the gifts of God. On to chapter 6. And now King Benjamin thought it was expedient, after having finished speaking to the people, that he should take the names of all those who have entered into a covenant with God to keep his commandments. And it came to pass that there was not one soul, except it were little children, but who had entered into the covenant and had taken upon them the name of Christ. So if you ever wanted to know why the church keeps so many records, now you know. Interesting to note, we're going to talk about this later in Mosiah 27, the sons of Mosiah and the son of Alma were obviously part of this group that were too young to partake in the covenant because they become very troublesome later. Verse 3, And again it came to pass that when King Benjamin had made an end of all these things and had consecrated his son Mosiah to be a ruler and a king over his people and had given him all the charges concerning the kingdom and also had appointed priests to teach the people that thereby they might hear and know the commandments of God and to stir them up in remembrance of the oath which they had made, he dismissed the multitude and they returned everyone according to their families to their own house. Verse 6, And it came to pass that King Mosiah did walk in the ways of the Lord, and did observe his judgments and his statutes, and did keep his commandments in all things whatsoever he commanded them. And King Mosiah did cause his people that they should till the earth, and he also himself did till the earth, that thereby he may not become burdensome to his people that he might do according to that which his father had done in all things. And there was no contention among all his people for the space of three years. You have to think that King Benjamin must have been very, very dramatic. I mean, you get that sense when you read it today. But what would it have been like to be there in person all those years ago? And the effect that it had, no more contention among his people for three years. Well, we've wrapped up our smaller amount of reading for this week. Keep on reading. We have lots of interesting things to talk about in the weeks ahead. I'll see you next week.